Please welcome Andrew Sutherland. Good morning and welcome, ladies and gentlemen. It is now 25 past 11. It's day two of Open World here in London. It's time to talk tech. My name is Andrew Sutherland, and I'm going to take you through a session where we're going to look at the technologies which underpin not just these beehives, but the modern digital business and the modern digital transformation. And yes, I'm going to be joined on stage by a key member of the Oracle Development Organization. We've managed to prize one of them away from his red-hot keyboard in red-hot Redwood Shores to join me on stage and drill into some of the latest developments and the latest innovations in the Oracle technology stack. But fun and exciting as technology is to all of us, of course, that's not its sole purpose. It's there to drive business outcome. And who better to talk about business outcome, what they might be, how they can be achieved, than the users and customers of that technology themselves. And I'm delighted to say we're also going to have two very impressive organizations join me on the stage very shortly. The Ministry of Defense, no less, in particular its Youth and Cadets Division, and also the organization that looks after the infrastructure in the United Kingdom that delivers electricity and gas, the National Grid EOS. But impressive organizations, and we can look forward to hear what they have to say about the use of digital technologies underpinning the digital business. Now, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that pretty much the whole of humankind now looks towards technology as the primary driver of progress, longevity, health, wealth, and certainly our business leaders and our politicians have got very high expectations of what we can do with technology. And we will, of course, deliver against these expectations. All of us in this room in our various roles, we're going to go forth and we'll use data to find new insights to do new things in new ways. We're going to develop new algorithms and new tool sets. We'll create new processes that will push back boundaries and continue to progress. And we'll do so using human inventiveness, ingenuity, human innovation, and we'll do so, each of us, in our own unique ways. But there will be some very clear common threads. And in particular, a thread which our forebears would have recognized. If we're going to build value creation machines, whether it's in the form of a ship that's going to go to the exotic lands to bring back spices, whether the value creation engine is in the form of a plow, or whether it's in the form of a digital business, we need to equip ourselves with the very best tools, the very best techniques, and the very best materials. We can't build the value creation structures of tomorrow using the tools of yesterday. And that's really what we're here to examine. So let's start exploring the construction of a digital business. It doesn't need to be built from scratch. It could be the transformation of an existing one. And in particular, let's start exploring the technology that must underpin that. And we can see quite clearly emerging some key characteristics of successful digital transformations and digital businesses. They're becoming pretty clear as time goes by. And the first, we'll come back to it in just a minute, is that they'll be data-driven. Data now, of course, the organizations themselves are data-driven, almost by definition. But the underlying technologies have to reflect that. The tools and processes need to reflect that. And they, too, need to be data-driven. 
There's been a constant battle, hasn't there, in the world of data, good and evil, as to whether it fragments and disperses and diverges, or we try and keep it in one place to have a single version of the truth. That will go on. And the successful digital business will be one in which the underlying infrastructure provides a converged data store. I think it's becoming almost received wisdom, as our, our friends over the Atlantic would say, a no-brainer. It's received wisdom that it will have to be an autonomous platform. We can't possibly deal with the deluge of information coming our way if it can't look after itself. And of course, it's going to be cloud-based. So let's begin with the first of these characteristics. Data-driven organization in the future will, of course, be data-driven. But so must its underlying technology and tools. It'll make decisions not just on the basis of a whim or some executive's thought. Or it'll be based on real evidence, real data, more and more as that data is collected, more and more. The processes will be data-driven. There'll be less hardwired logic. The process flow will be according more to what's actually inside the data packet. The business applications themselves will be more data-driven. But what about the tools we use then to create these data-driven applications and these data-driven processes? Are they the same tools as yesterday? Not necessarily. Many of yesterday's tool sets, our programming languages and so on, were really developed for an area where there was a focus on process and algorithms and the volumes of data were nothing like that we have to deal with today. What will these new data tool sets look like? So who could perhaps shed some light on this? Well, I can think of nobody better than somebody who's worked within a data-driven organization, and I mean that in every sense of the word data-driven, Oracle, and who's worked in that organization for 30 years, significantly longer than I have, who was part of the original database development team, and who was the driving force behind one of the major innovations in the last few years, the combination of hardware and software into the Exadata machine. Ladies and gentlemen, fresh from California here to windy London, please give a warm welcome to Juan Luisa. Juan. You've got a clicker. Hi, Juan. Thanks very much for joining us, uh, Juan. Hopefully the weather's not been too bad for you so far. It's a little bit of a change. I think it's as expected. As expected, exactly. <laughs> well, Juan, let's drive right into data-driven right away. There's a risk here. As organizations talk about being data-driven, they need the underlying tools to do that. And of course, the pressure comes on IT. And I fear a risk of, again, an explosion in complexity. It's going to be difficult for developers to create these data-driven applications and, and processes. There's an awful lot to do. What are we doing with an Oracle to make life easier for the developer here? OK, thanks, Andrew. So I'm going to walk through some of the things that we're doing as part of the database team at Oracle to make uh, the next generation of apps, which are data-driven apps, uh, dramatically simpler. So this is, gets a little bit geeky, but not too much. So <laughs> stick with me. <laughs> So I'm going to walk through. So when we talk about data-driven apps, there's a number of things that we're working on. So we're talking about things. We've talked about machine learning, AI, things like blockchain, uh, social graph-based applications, spatial, JSON, IoT. So I'm going to talk about how you build a data-driven app, how we make it, how we natively integrate all this technology into the database to make it dramatically simpler to develop these apps. So I'm going to go through these one by one. So let's start with machine learning. So we've heard a lot about AI and machine learning. Well, this is something we've been working on in the Oracle database team for quite a while. And our goal has been to make machine learning easy, deploying and using machine learning, making data-driven business decisions easy. So what we're doing is we're putting this technology straight into the core of the database. So we've taken over 30 in database machine learning algorithms, including deep learning. Uh, and we use these now to make real-time recommendations, fraud detection. It's really business. What we're working on in the database is business machine learning. You've heard about kind of images and cancer. We're working on business machine learning. So we built these algorithms into the Oracle database. Uh, and you can directly call those. So, so database developers, application developers, 
can directly call those just as SQL statements. So you don't have to create a separate machine learning system, move all your data, synchronize the thing, keep it current. You just call machine learning algorithms directly in the database, in the data warehouse, in the OTP, build the model in the data warehouse, run it in the OTP in real time. And you can extend these algorithms also with Python and R-based algorithms that you develop outside the database. So it's something we've been working on a lot. We have a new uh, version of our Oracle database. It's about to ship. It should ship starting next week, where we have something called AutoML, Auto Machine Learning. Because the hard part of machine learning is figuring out how to use all these algorithms. So we've, we've made that completely automatic so it can predict things. It can look at data, look at outcomes in the past, and say, hey, these are the things that predict outcomes. So it'll automatically configure that. Um, and this is something we've been working on for a while. And this, this whole data science, data mining, machine learning was, uh, used to be a very niche application. And now it's become very mainstream. So what we've decided to do is include this for free in all our editions of our Oracle database. So we make machine learning super easy for everyone to adopt. And when we talk about machine learning, this is very sophisticated algorithms that we've been working on for over 20 years. Uh, and it's really machine learning for a business data. So that's the first thing. Build machine learning natively into the database. Let's talk about another big thing. You hear a lot about blockchain technology. Again, our goal is to make using blockchain technology for these data-driven apps uh, dramatically simple. And blockchain's all about identifying and preventing fraud. That's kind of what blockchain's all about. So we've done something very unique, very different, very innovative with blockchain. We're the first database to put blockchain technology directly into the core of the database. So with Oracle Database 20C, again, the release that we'll start shipping next week, we built for free something called blockchain tables. And it's super simple. You just create a table, tell me it's a blockchain table. And then as rows, as data is inserted into the table, we automatically cryptographically encrypt the data and chain the data together, which is what blockchain does. And then users can sign the data if they want to also, and the provider can sign the data. So it makes it super easy to adopt this blockchain technology in existing applications or new applications. Super easy. The blockchain tables just look like regular tables. They act like regular tables. They can participate in queries and transactions. So this takes that new generation of technology in the core of the database dramatically easy. OK, next thing, let's talk about more data-driven things. So graph analytics, social graphs. So that's another big thing now. It's like, look at the people, how they interconnect, who are the influencers? Who are the dependencies? What are the communities? You know, how do you look at people that are coordinating to create fraud? Uh, so this is a new generation of technologies that's being built into data-driven apps. And again, our goal is make this dramatically simple. So we built over 50 parallel social graph algorithms directly into the database. Things like community detection, pathfinding, uh, ranking, centrality, that kind of stuff. Uh, and we, again, you just call those with very simple APIs. You don't have to move data, create a separate database, do all that kind of stuff. And again, this, this is something we've had for a number of years. We keep enhancing it, and we've decided to make it free. Again, make it widely available. Now that this is a common technology, it's no longer like a niche, small number of people using this. It's very common. So we made it free in all database editions. Again, making that graph technology super easy. And again, we're talking about very sophisticated algorithms that are already in use in thousands of enterprises. So this is not some vaporware or some new thing. This is very sophisticated graph algorithms. OK, one more, uh, spatial. It's another big thing. Everything includes some kind of spatial operation now. Uh, and again, same formula. We're making spatial really easy for the new generation of data-driven apps. So we've taken hundreds of spatial operations. So we, again, this is a technology we've had for many years. And what you can do with spatial technologies in real time, you can, for example, simple thing, compute distance between places, uh, assets, people. So you say, where's the nearest place I can buy this widget? Uh, but it goes well beyond that. You can analyze transportation, telecom networks, sales territories, marketing territories. Is it working well? Is it not working well? Uh, it's already in use by pretty much every government in the world to do land management, public safety, uh, defense, uh, also for analyzing satellite imagery. So it's extremely sophisticated technology that we've had for years. We keep enhancing it. And again, we've now, 
This has become very mainstream. It used to be very niche. Only a small number of people wanted this. Now it's very mainstream. So we've made it freely available across the entire Oracle database. So we're making it dramatically easier to build these data-driven apps. And there are hundreds of these, of these algorithms uh, that are used and used already by thousands of enterprises, pretty much every major government in the world. OK, another area. So we heard about the bees, IoT, IoT's Internet of Things. There's devices, manufacturing, cars, streaming data into databases. Um, it's been a challenge to get that data into databases. Uh, so again, we're trying to make that super easy. And the way this works, it's a very simple concept, which is you take standard SQL, instead of trying to put it straight into the database with all the asset properties, which slows it down, we just buffer the automatically buffer the memory, the data in memory, the IoT data. A background process bulk loads it, makes it super easy, super fast to use Oracle database for IoT data. Uh, and it is super fast. You can uh, insert 25 million data elements per second on a simple two-socket server. And then you get the full analytic capabilities of Oracle for this IoT data. So that's yet another way we're making data-driven apps super easy. And one last thing I'm going to talk about is JSON. So JSON's very popular with developers uh, because it allows dynamic structuring of the data. So we've been working on integrating JSON and relational for many years. Uh, and our goal is to make it so that uh, developers can use the right format for the right use case. So for example, if you know the format of the data, you can use the standard relational column format. But for dynamic data, it's super easy now to use JSON. We've been integrating JSON into the database for several years, and the algorithms are super sophisticated. It's more sophisticated than actually pure JSON databases. Uh, and as an example of that, you can take, if you know what JSON is, you can take any JSON element and index it automatically. You can do ACID and parallel SQL across JSON and relational data. Again, super easy to take all these technologies, machine learning, spatial, social graph, IoT, JSON, integrate it directly in the database, just call a function, you get it. You don't have to stand up a separate database. You don't have to do anything. It makes it super easy to develop these next generation data-driven Which apps. is exactly what we need to be able to do. So a lot of more capability, many of which was there already, as you mentioned one, but being continually developed upon and a lot more functionality for the developer. But developers are also in this world of building data-driven organizations. It's not just the, the tools they use, they're actually using new paradigms as well. They're developing using microservices, they're developing using event-driven programming, they're thinking about CI, CD. Do we do anything to actually help these development paradigms as well? Yes, yeah, so, so right, it's not just the technology is changing, the development paradigms. So we have to support these development paradigms. If we want to make developing these data-driven apps easy, fast, and inexpensively, we have to support these things. So I'm going I'm, I'm to walk through how we're doing some of this. So let's start with microservices. Microservices, very common development paradigm. I'm not going to explain it here. But the idea is we want to make it super easy to develop using microservices. And the way we do this is we allow each microservice to basically store its data in a logically separate database, a logically separate data container. And then we can, at the physical level, either separate or combine these logical databases to either simplify the deployment or make it more scalable and more isolated. So by using these technologies, you can use microservices in the app tier with containers and Kubernetes. In the database tier, you use pluggable database for every microservice, and it makes it dramatically easier to develop using this new microservice paradigm. And on the topic of microservice, Another area we've been working very hard on is something I call data as a microservice. So treat data as if it was a microservice. So it's something that developers find very, are very comfortable and very rapid to develop in. So it's D-A-A-M, data as a microservice. So the idea here is actually pretty straightforward, which is we take, you can take any SQL statement, any view, any stored procedure, and tell Oracle to automatically generate a REST interface on top of it with JSON outputs. So that's the output that the way that developers, new age developers, want to access data using REST and using JSON. So what we do is now 
with these data as a microservice, instead of using traditional database interfaces, you, you use a, a, a new age, very standardized REST API. You call the database using REST. Uh, and this simplifies and standardizes access to the database. Also, um, you can use Java or PLSQL stored procedures inside the database and call that from your microservice using REST uh, to eliminate a lot of network round trips, which really slow down the application. And this is just like JavaScript is used in the browser. So if you're a developer, you know that you use JavaScript in the browser to eliminate all these expensive round trips. You do the exact same thing with data as a microservice. So this is another area we've been focused on, a new development paradigm, which is instead of calling traditional, the traditional way to databases, treat a database as a microservice. So it's data as a microservice. OK, let's move on to events. So this is very popular, extremely popular with developers. Uh, developers want to, want to use something called event-driven programming. And again, I'm not going to go into the details of that. But I just want to say that our goal is to make that super simple. And there's a number of ways we're doing. So the leading event platform is Kafka. So what we're doing is we're integrating the database with the event-driven application framework. And there's a number of different ways we're doing that. For example, we can use our Golden Gate replication product. So you can take changes as they occur in the database, and we'll stream them out to Kafka and make them into events that can be consumed by other parts of the business. We can also do the opposite. So we can stream events out. Now we can also, and this is available now, query the Kafka events from the database. So we treat it as an external table. We standardize this. You can run analytic queries inside the database against events that are in Kafka. And another thing that we're doing is integrating the Kafka events with the events that we've had in the Oracle database for years, which are called queues, advanced queues. So advanced queues are a lot like events, but they're transactional. You get ACID uh, properties, and you get very uh, good analytic queries on them. So we're integrating those. So, you, so what we're doing is we're integrating the APIs. So an application that's written to use Kafka to push events and pull events from Kafka, we're making it possible for that to automatically push and pull events from AQs in the database that people have been using for, for decades. So tightly integrating the event-driven model into the database, outgoing, incoming, and the APIs as well. Make it super easy to develop with these paradigms. Um, and then I want to talk about SaaS. So SaaS is software as a service. That's how large apps are developed now. That's how multi-tenant apps are developed now. And this is something we put a lot of emphasis on, because Oracle builds multi-tenant apps. We build our Fusion applications for ERP that are used by thousands of large enterprises around the world. We have NetSuite that's used by thousands of small enterprises, tens of thousands of small enterprises. Um, and what we've done is we built the SaaS model directly into the database to make it super easy to develop SaaS apps. So the idea here, again, is, is, is the same kind of idea of a logical database. So when you have a SaaS app, let's say you have a financial app, you might have 10,000, 100,000 companies that are using that SaaS app. What we do in the database is we give each of these companies, each of these users, a logically separate database. So it's physically one database, but it looks and feels like a logically separate database. And this has a lot of advantage. It makes it easy to develop these SaaS apps because the tenants become completely transparent to the application. Uh, and since each tenant is in a logically separate database, you can do operations on the tenant. You can clone the data. You can back up the data for just the one tenant. You can restore the data. You can do DR on just that data. You can move that tenant from place to place. Uh, and the database enforces the tenant security. So it's no longer every piece of the app has to enforce that tenant security. And also, you can use standard tools, like analytic tools, against that logical database. So each tenant can run their own tools against their data. So it's a very different SaaS architecture for developing SaaS. And it's something that we built into the database. We're already using this in NetSuite and in Fusion Apps and in Taleo. And there's a lot of other customers using it as well. And then the last thing as far as developing, continuous delivery. So again, this is something developers really want. It used to be that you develop a new version of your, of your software. And you know, once a year or so, you ship the new version. Well, that model's in the past. Everyone wants continuous integration and delivery. You want to make, you want to make the new functionality available every day, every week. Uh, so you can't have these large changes that require downtime to apply. So this is something, again, we've been working on for many years at Oracle. 
Um, and the key thing here on the database side is when the app changes, those changes can't require downtime in the production application. You can't stop your airline ticketing or your bank because you want to make some change to the app. So all these changes have to come in completely online. And we built very sophisticated functionality. We have something called addition-based uh, redefinition. So we have multiple versions of the database schema active. Uh, we can change the format of the, data, of the data completely online. I've talked about the native JSON XML, which are dynamic formats. Uh, so these are technologies that we built, and they're used by very sophisticated applications. So already, Salesforce uses this uh, addition-based redefinition to keep their applications online while they change it. Uh, and we have many customers. They also use things like, uh, like the online table redefinition. Keep the applications online, continuously roll out changes. Uh, so this eliminates this need to batch up all the changes into one downtime window a year, one downtime window a quarter. It's a big deal. So those are, the, those are the ways that we're making it easy to develop using these new paradigms, things like microservices, things like CI, CD, things like events. Absolutely. It's much better technology. So you've been very busy, Juan. There's a lot of development in the database here. So what I've heard is that there's deep native integration. So when the request is to build the data-driven organization and to look to the tool sets to do that, don't get bolt-ons. These are being fully integrated and therefore close to the data, the very thing which is driving the whole process exactly where you want it to be. The outcome of that, of course, is that it's easy and it's simpler, less prone to error, of course, and yes. higher speed in development. But one I also heard that in many ways now the, the tool, the arsenal a developer has in, in building these applications nowadays is expanding it. It's not just the tool sets that we saw in the past. ML is now a tool. Blockchain is now a tool to use in my new developments. And that's being made available for free as part of this as well. Yes, right. All these, all these things, blockchain, ML, graph, it's all, all now free, included by default in the Oracle database. You've got it there as well. Now, you may not know this, actually, Juan. In fact, I don't think you do, but I'm a very keen amateur home automator. I program in Python, and I use Kafka and so on. I've got Z-Wave devices all over the house just to annoy my wife. And I notice that there's lots of different types of data flying around. An awful lot of it is key value pair. This door's open, that window's shut. There's spatial data, as you've touched upon earlier. And I, as an amateur, but of course I know many of our customers as well, there's a temptation to look for a different data storage, a database for these different data types. There's a temptation to do this. That can't be right, is it? Yeah, so that's, that's an important topic. So there's a debate in the community about this topic of do I put my data in one place and run all my functions there, or do I use single purpose databases for every person? So I have a machine learning database, a spatial database, a graph database. So there's a big debate that's going on. And we have a pretty, pretty uh, strong position on this debate, as you can imagine. So, I want to introduce the concept of a converged product, uh, because that's what we're talking about here. And the analogy that I use here is a smartphone. So it used to be that if you wanted to make phone calls, you had a phone. If you want to do photos, you got a digital camera. If you want to do music, you got a musical device. So all these things and many more were separate products. And they, you had to buy each of them, and you use them. But that's changed now. So what's happened is, all these products have gone into one converged product, which is a smartphone. So there are really features of a smartphone now. And what I'm talking about here is it's the same thing happening in the data management world. So when machine learning first came out, when JSON first came out, when blockchain first came out, it came out as a completely separate product. Hey, you want blockchain, you use an entirely different blockchain system, different way of developing, different way of storing data, different way of accessing data. All proprietary, same thing with machine learning, same thing with JSON. Hey, you need a JSON database. You can't use a regular database. But what's happened now, and what I've talked about, is these things are being converged into a converged product. So they're really features of a converged database now. And there's two giant benefits here. One is it's just a lot simpler. It's inherently simpler to have one product. It's just like one smartphone is a lot simpler than carrying 10 devices around and plugging them all in and powering them all and recharging them and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but there's a second uh, benefit, which is a little more subtle, which is the synergy. By having all these things in one phone, 
like the music can now stream from the internet because it's part of one thing that the, the, uh, the, mu the you know, you get all these benefits from combining these features into one. And the same thing happens with a converged database. If you can run machine learning and spatial and blockchain, then you get machine learning on spatial data and you get blockchain protection of that whole thing. So you get synergies across these features by making them in, putting them into one converged product. And that's where, that's where our primary focus is. Although we support special purpose databases, our primary focus is create a converged product that's much simpler, much easier to adopt, much easier for developers. So, and this is somewhere where we, a place where we stand in opposition in a different place from some of our competitors. So if you look at what Amazon and a lot of niche database uh, vendors say, they say you should run a single purpose database, and almost all those are proprietary databases for each data type and workload. So it's a separate database for machine learning, for spatial, for graph, for everything. Uh, we say run a converged open database that does it all. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about two or three quick uh, quick benefits of this, which are mostly pretty obvious. If you think about this, this is kind of a no-brainer decision. Uh, one thing is for developers, it's dramatically simpler to develop using a converged database. So if I have a database and I need to do some spatial operation, find, this guy wants to buy this widget, where's the closest location you can get that widget? It's much simpler to just call a, a, a spatial query inside that same database than it is to stand up a separate spatial database, move all the customer data into there, move all the real-time inventory in it, keep it up to date constantly, keep it synchronized with all the other databases, manage it, do all that stuff. Much simpler, just call the spatial query in the database. So for developers, this is a no-brainer because creating this distributed execution data movement, extremely complex. Also, on the management side, once you've created all these plethora of specialized databases, you kind of have a nightmare going forward. So every step is simple. You say, oh yeah, I need spatial, let me just stand up this guy. Oh, I need machine learning, let's do it. I need JSON, let's do this. Oh, I need, I need graph, let's do that. Every time you take that step, it's a simple step. But now you have to manage these for the rest of your life. Uh, you have to make them all highly available, secure, scalable. Every one of them is different. Everyone manages different, everyone secures different, the models are different. It's a nightmare for IT. So we stand pretty clearly on this, that it's much simpler on a converged database side, and that's what we're working on. Now, some people say, well, this isn't open. Uh, I was going to say that one. Okay. This isn't open. <laughs> the flip side of the coin, of course, is when you start talking about having one management environment, et cetera, and being converged. The flip side is often that's associated with being a closed system. You're going to try and trap me into that. Surely we're not going to do that. Right. So you got to look at what's really open and what's really closed, right? So Amazon, for example, is a big proponent of this single purpose database. Uh, the trouble is all the databases that they develop, Redshift, Dynamo, all the rest of them, they only run on Amazon. If you want to run them on premises, nope. If you want to run them in the Oracle Cloud, nope. If you want to run them on Microsoft Cloud, nope. None of that. It's completely proprietary. Uh, whether it's the Oracle database, it'll run everywhere. It'll run on Amazon, it'll run on Azure, it'll run on-prem, it'll run everywhere. And the other key thing is Oracle's based on open standards. So we've always been based on open standards. Things like SQL, Java, REST, JSON. It's completely open standards based. You look at what Amazon does. They start with an open source product. They close it, and then they add all these proprietary interfaces. So my example there is if you use DynamoDB, something they talk a lot about, completely proprietary APIs. Once you've written your application of that, you've written to their APIs, their data models, their transaction models, their indexing models, you're stuck. <laughs> that application can't run anywhere else. Uh, and it requires a complete rewrite of the application to, write it, to run it everywhere else. If you use Oracle with open standard SQL, you can run it anywhere you want. It's, it's much more open. So one pretty compelling arguments for supporting the creation of data-driven platforms, and of course, again, a compelling argument for converging that data and avoiding pain in the future. So one other aspect we could not leave the stage without discussing, of course, of the future digital business. It will 
be autonomous. The underlying platform will be autonomous. And as you would say, one, it's a no-brainer. We'd say it's received wisdom. Now, how else are we possibly going to manage the sheer issues facing the volume of information, trying to keep that secure, if we don't have that data standing in its own two feet, looking after itself? It's logical and it's inevitable. Now, what we've done here with autonomous is we've really, it's physician heal thyself. We've turned our own science, our data science, onto ourselves to solve our own issues. And we've applied machine learning to the issue of managing data. It's looking for patterns. Often these patterns of behavior can be leading indicators of something which is going to happen. So you can spot a pattern and maybe take preventative action. And that's exactly what's going on millisecond by millisecond, microsecond by microsecond within the autonomous database. It can provision itself. It's got disaster protection. And of course, it can take a good go at tuning itself as well. Again, it can recognize patterns of behavior, how the workload is making demands of the database, and ensure that it tunes effectively. Very clever indeed. I am coming to the conclusion I can't see any other way that a modern organization can keep its data secure if it's not making use of artificial intelligence to do so. There's just no competition to the all-seeing eye of artificial intelligence understanding what the normal pattern of usage is, and therefore being able to identify the exceptions. Again, it's an absolute no-brainer. In terms of outcomes, I'm going to hear about this in just a second. Perhaps the most fundamental outcome of autonomous IT systems overall, eh, Juan? Not, just the, not just the database, but the most fundamental outcome is that it frees up that most valuable commodity that any of us have, the neuron second our own actual intelligent conscious brain time. And it frees up that. And I think there's two ways. It's been well known for some time that the DBA time can be free. The more drudgery tasks can be removed. The DBA can spend more time making sure the reviewing architectures are optimized, implementing more projects, bringing on board new technologies such as ML, etc. But perhaps when it's not so often spoken about that the valuable brain time of the developer is also saved with autonomous. A lot of effort has gone into making sure that whether you're a low-code developer or whether you're a more professionally oriented, full-time developer using more sophisticated tools, that your favorite IDE has been integrated again tightly into the database to help save your time and effort. It's a groundbreaking technology. Well advised to take a look at it if you haven't done so already. I think if the database or the autonomous database were able to speak, I hold a secret little fancy that it would speak with a Scottish accent. <laughs> and not least of all, because it cuts its coat according to its cloth. It'll only use as much power and money as it needs to use. It'll detect constantly what the demand of the workload is upon it and scale itself up as it needs to and scale itself down when it doesn't, right down to the point of shutting down if necessary. It's a thrifty database. Now, all of this is part of a platform which is continually developing. One occasionally comes over here, but most of the time working pretty hard. And this platform is benefiting from a continual development. Once you get in it, it's like being in an elevator. You just get raised as the platform functionality raises. It's been around for a while now. You may be aware there's two versions of it. There is the autonomous transaction processing. Version. That's where the machine learning has been tuned to understand the peculiarities of OLTP workloads and as a result, tune in that direction. That's been around for about a year, yep. and, a year. and about two years for the ADW version, where again, the machine learning has been more tuned towards the reading and analytics requirements of a database, which has meant there are thousands and thousands of customers around about the world. But I am particularly delighted to be able to welcome one of them to the stage now. We have from the Ministry of Defense, in particular the Youth and Cadets group within the Ministry of Defense, a user of the autonomous database and indeed its analytics, please welcome to the stage Simon Hunt. Simon. <laughs> Hiya, Simon. Hi, Andrew. Hi, Am. Hi. Jangling with gadgetry here, sorry. Thanks very much indeed for joining us on the stage, Simon. Now, I'm not sure, I'm sure everybody here knows what the Ministry of Defence is. Sure. Um, but yep. the Ministry of Defence, Youth and Cadets, it's a pretty large organisation within the MOD, I understand. I wonder if you could just spend a couple of minutes describing to the folks here what that is, and perhaps especially what on earth it's got to do with Oracle and why you need <laughs> our technology. Yeah, absolutely, Andrew. Okay, so. 
The youth and cadets, we, we look after the, first of all, the army cadet force uh, that is the, um, uh, the cadet force that's based in the community. Mm -hmm. We also have the combined cadet force, which is more the, the school-based. Okay. Uh, there is also uh, an organi organization called the VCC, the Volunteer Cadet Corps, who are based within uh, garrisons. And then we have the Sea Cadet Corps as well. Now, interestingly enough, uh, the cadet movement as a whole is bigger than the, uh, than the army. Okay, uh, there's, there's more of them than there are. Absolutely, sort of. about 150,000 uh, in total. That's cadets and adult volunteers, aged anywhere from 12 years old up to 17. Indeed. And then adult volunteers from Indeed. 18 upwards. And the use of Oracle, what sorts of things are you using our technology to do? What are the challenges that you're facing? Absolutely. So as with any large organization, uh, first of all, it's, it's personnel management. That's, okay. the, that's the, the heart of it, both cadets uh, and the adult volunteers. Uh, but then we have a lot of activity going on. Uh, and it could be uh, course attendance. It, it could be the forecast of events, the standard sort of weekend okay. training, that sort of thing. And then we also do things like uh, inventory management. Okay. So, uh, you know, issuing of tents, issue, issuing of clothing, ammunition, that sort of thing. All of that stored in the system. So, that, so analytics, we'll, we'll come to the, the, the autonomous database piece in a second. It's almost as if it were the uh, eight-ninths of the iceberg that's under the water. But on the surface, there's the analytics piece. Who's using these analytics? Who's creating these reports? Who needs to see what kind of data through this analytic sure. capability? Sure. Um, well, there's... Um so the system itself has been uh, been around since about 2007. Okay. Uh, and we've been using the traditional Oracle tool set. So been an Oracle user for a lengthy time. BI um, publisher being, okay. being the main one. Oracle Discoverer, but, you know, okay. back in the day, but obviously we've retired that now. Um, so we have a number of different reports. So we have some uh, highly formatted uh, business analytics reports that get uh, sent out to senior staff within the organization yep. to tell them how they're getting on, for instance, with uh, the, you know, their training, yep. uh, uh, how many cadets are going through what training, what training levels they're okay. achieving, that sort of thing. So these are rather specific requirements you've got for analytics. They won't necessarily come from any out-of-the-box application, so you need rapid yep. visualization capabilities. Let's talk about it coming from the cloud then, Simon. So underneath the water level, as it were, the infrastructure providing the, the backdrop to that, these analytics. What sort of benefits do you get from the Oracle Autonomous Database? Uh, well, from the Autonomous Database, uh, the main one, I think, is we no longer have to administer it. We can hand off the infrastructure administration, the database patching. Yep. We can hand that off to the people that can actually probably do it oh, the best. The machine that can do it, yeah. Oracle. Um, so, so you can take care of that. We'll take care of the application. Okay. So that's the main one. There's also uh, a simplification within the architecture. So we've stripped out essentially our mid-tier. Yep. So, so uh, WebLogic Server okay. no longer appears in our tech stack. Um, we get the Elastic Compute. So we yep. can, we can okay, have, we we, of. exactly. So we have to run 24 hours uh, for safeguarding purposes. At night, we have very little usage. Okay. So we can leave it at four CPUs. And then as that, we get basically two peaks during the day. Uh, and it will, so it's what it needs. According, it's scaling according to that. Now, the main benefit you mentioned there, of course, was the saving of time and effort. What are you going to do with that saved time? What's next? Oh, well, it, so the main one is a, a saving in cost, which means okay. we can reinvest that in other parts of the organization. But my role, or my role as I see it, is to take uh, the time of the volunteers, which is very, very precious and very limited time, the less administration that mm -hmm. they have to do, uh, the more that they can do uh, actually hands-on training with the children themselves. Okay. okay, one good example of this is we're introducing now uh, integration between the school's uh, databases okay. and, and potentially have a system whereby they literally just tick a box, so they're in the cadet movement, and that will automatically upload the information that we require uh, into our system. And I know finally, Simon, that you started this off using the free tier, and we should really mention to everybody here that what you hear being available, the autonomous database, is available for free, actually for life, for in, in, in a restricted way, obviously. But on the other hand, you were, you were using that, you've got a login, and you can have at your disposal the sorts of services to allow you to try out all sorts of different services within the Oracle Cloud. Uh, absolutely. It's, it's actually an important part of our procurement process that we run a proof okay. of concept. Um, we also try out some of the, the new and emerging technologies and see how that they, they, they can suit our organization. I've just got a whole load more that I'm uh, going to be going away. <laughs> and uh, thank you There's very much. There's a lot, much, to, lot to look at and use that feature to do I'm, so. I'm just wondering how I can use the, the blockchain yeah. table uh, within our Fantastic. organization. Fantastic. Simon, thank you very much indeed for joining us on stage. Thank Ladies you. Gentlemen, please. A warm hand for Simon Mayer. <clears throat> Good man. So, one, we've got a pretty impressive looking database there. It's right up to what we need in the modern world. 
But the database needs the right platform to run upon. It cannot stand alone, however clever it is. It needs a platform. Can you take us through some of the latest developments in the underlying infrastructure? Yeah, so let me talk a little bit about our Oracle Cloud, which is where our autonomous database runs. And a lot of people don't understand the Oracle Cloud um, and don't understand what we do that's different, that's better. So, you know, my theme here is cloud the right way. So first of all, we provide the ability to choose where you want to run. So you can run a traditional, you know, again, I'm focused on data management, I'm going to focus on, on that topic, but you can run traditionally on-premise. So we have the same platform that runs on-premise and in the public cloud, which is our premier exadata platform. On-premise, you buy it and use it and manage it yourself. In public cloud, you subscribe to it and then we manage it. We also have kind of a hybrid, which is unique, which is we take our public cloud technology, the exact same hardware, software, interfaces, APIs, and we allow you to run that in your data center. And I'll get back to that in a minute. You can also create a private region for a specific large customer. And all of these use the same you know, proven converged database that I talk about with a proven exadata platform, which is in use by so many of the world's leading businesses. So that's one thing. And let me get back to the exadata part. So where we're really focused is mission critical cloud. And uh, Andrew talked about autonomous data. So we're building a mission critical autonomous database. Um, and a key part to that is our converged database that customers have been using for years, but also our exadata platform. Exadata is now used by 86% of the largest companies in the world. Uh, and if you exclude some large government-owned Chinese businesses, it's well into the 90s. So the large majority of the businesses in the world, not just the biggest, but many smaller as well, are running on this technology for their most mission-critical work. And this exact, tech, this exact platform is what we run in our cloud. And in our cloud, the main difference is it's much simpler and more elastic. So you use the web-driven APIs, and you get a subscription model with pay-per-use. That's the primary benefit of going to the cloud. Same mission-critical platform. Let me talk a little bit about how easy it is to adopt. So this cloud at customer model makes it easy to adopt our cloud. Because moving an entire IT into the public cloud, very difficult. And the hard part is not the database. Database has standard APIs. It's well contained. What's hard is moving the tangle of applications that have been developed over decades. So one thing we allow is we bring the cloud into your data center. And that's what we call our, our generation two exadata cloud at customer. Um, you deploy that in your data center using the cloud model. And then the, the, your applications can just connect and run against it. So you just migrate your databases. It's very easy. It looks exactly like the exadata that's in the public cloud. The APIs, GUIs, everything are the same. The subscription model is there. Uh, but the data never leaves your data center. And you know, Andrew talked about our autonomous database. Our autonomous database is available in the public cloud today. And we'll be making that available in this clouded customer model later this year. So, so our leading technology is all coming together, available anywhere you want it. Another big difference is security. So we work with super mission critical data, banks, telecoms, airlines, public services. Security in the public cloud is really important. And we do this differently. We have something called hardware enforced security. So generally, cloud is a virtualized environment. In a virtualized environment, you depend on the hypervisor being separated from the user data. And if you can ever do a cyber attack from as a user into the hypervisor, you essentially own the whole cloud. Now, hypervisors are very secure, except when they're not. So in the last two years, at least four exploits have been published, publicly published against hypervisors. And the cloud vendors have rushed to fix them very quickly, so that's good. But the fact that already four exploits have been exposed against these means, hey, they're not as secure as you might think. So in our cloud, 
we allow customers to create a private isolation zone that's protected by hardware. So that hardware does not allow packets from any other tenant or any other entity into that isolation zone. So we don't depend on the hypervisor never again having another cyber attack since it's already had four that were successful. So that's, again, very different. We're very focused on keeping the public cloud data secure. Okay, another big thing, multi-cloud. So we've announced two big multi-cloud partnerships. One is with Microsoft, uh, with Microsoft Azure. So we're partnering with Microsoft Azure to make it easy for customers. A lot of customers have a lot of Microsoft products and Oracle products. And we're making it easy to customers to move their Microsoft products to the Microsoft Cloud and the Oracle products to the Oracle Cloud while keeping them interoperating. So we have deep uh, cross-platform performance, low latency, high performance, integration, security integration, interoperability. It's all announced and it's all working now. Also VMware, many of our customers run VMware on their on-premises environments and we've announced and implemented a partnership with VMware so customers can extend their VMware environments into our public cloud or run VMware workloads directly in our public cloud. So we're partnering uh, with leading vendors to make sure that, that our customers can get seamless uh, interoperability with other major vendors. Okay, let's talk about public cloud. How big is the public cloud? How many regions do you have? A lot of people don't know that our public cloud is extremely large. So today, we have 21 hyperscale public cloud regions around the world. Uh, and this year, we're adding 15 more. So by the end of this year, we'll actually have more public cloud regions than AWS has today. So everyone knows AWS has a big cloud. We're going to be bigger by the end of this year. So people don't recognize the scale of our public cloud. OK, let me talk about a little bit more technology, okay? So there's a few big benefits to cloud, but one of the biggest is elasticity and paper use. So you can grow and shrink as your usage grows and shrink. And we've talked about how autonomous database, we use a serverless architecture. You can dynamically grow and shrink it. You can turn it off, you pay just per use. So we started that with that with our autonomous database technology, but we're extending it into the standard cloud technology. So things like compute, memory, and storage, we're making it completely elastic, really elastic, elastic for real, true elasticity. So today, if you go to any cloud, it is elastic, kind of, sort of, depending on how you look at it. Because what you actually do, if you want to create a virtual machine to run in, you have to choose how many CPUs and how much memory you want. And you have to choose from a list of available options. So you say, hey, I want four CPUs and two gig of memory. Well, we don't have that, but we have four CPUs and eight gig of memory. Uh, what about three CPUs and 20 gig of memory? No, that ratio doesn't work. You can get, to get the 20 gig of memory, you're gonna have to bump up to 20, to 20 CPUs. Uh, so this is not truly elastic, but that's what exists today. And what's coming soon to our, our Oracle Cloud, Oracle Cloud infrastructure, is a truly elastic cloud, way ahead of anybody else. So you can actually choose with a little slider. You say, I want this much processing and this much memory. Arbitrary choice. You get what you need. You pay only for what you need. And you can change it. You can change it dynamically. So in the middle of running, if you want to change to something else, unlike traditional clouds where you have to shut the whole thing down and start it back up again, you can just change it on the fly. So we're trying to get the true elasticity, very different from what other vendors have. Uh, and the same thing on the storage. We have this today. We have this working today. Same thing. If you want storage in the cloud, you have to choose how much performance and, and how much capacity you want. And these things are kind of tied together. And if you want to change it, it requires downtime. So in, available now in our Oracle Cloud is those sliders that everybody wants. Say, hey, I need this much capacity with this much performance. And by the way, on the weekend, I still need the capacity because I need the data, but I don't need as much performance. So I want to slide this down so I can pay less money. So that's true paper use and the ability to change it online. Very unique technology in our cloud available today. So I've talked about some of the cloud stuff. And let me wrap up by talking a little bit about customers. So, our cloud has been available for several years now. And I've talked about our data management, our premier data management technology is our Exadata technology. 
So in our cloud, we already have a quarter of the largest enterprise in the world running with our Exadata cloud technology. So it's been very rapidly adopted. Why? Because it's mission critical proven technology that customers can get in the cloud and get all the benefits, the rapid provisioning, the pay per use, the elasticity, all that. Um, and I want to mention one other customer because we're on the topic of tech for good. So one customer in our cloud that I want to mention, CARE, uh, this is the kind of philanthropic organization. And just by moving uh, their, their applications to our cloud, they were able to reduce their cost by 35% and their audit fees by 65%. Fantastic. That's so a great, great example, great example of, of a great customer example running of, our uh, cloud. Exactly, OCI in action. And we've got another example here actually right with us. The National Grid ESO is an organization that manages and operates uh, a large scale infrastructure, the electricity supply and gas across the UK and indeed parts of uh, North America as well. We're delighted to have them as users of OCI. Please welcome to the stage, James Galloway. James. Thanks, Juan. Hey James, nice to be here. Nice to meet you. Come on, sit down. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. I think most of us touch you in some way or another during our daily lives, of course. Indeed. But perhaps you may be going just for a moment a little bit more deeply into what the business is, what it is you have to do. Happily. So um, our day job is to essentially ensure that uh, people have power whenever or wherever they need it. Um, it's a mission critical role for the UK um, and it's one that we take very seriously. Um, I work at the National Control Centre where all of this actually happens. Okay, so what particular problems again were you actually looking towards Oracle to help solve? What, what was the challenge that faced you in your digital business? Sure, so we've, we've got two key missions that we've got challenges with. Um, one of which is um, climate change. You know, we are the first generation to fully understand what climate change is. We're probably also the last that can actually do anything about it. Um, and in, the in, in our industry, um, we are targeted to be uh, net zero by 2050. Um, in fact, what the ESO is doing is it's enabling the electricity power system to run carbon free for at least one hour by 2025. That's a moonshot in terms of technology and engineering. How do you engineering. do that? How do you use so how do, we, how do we do that? We do that um, by being able to accurately understand what's going to happen next. Okay, so you're predictive. Yeah, let me give you a very simple example. Um, in the old world of energy, if you wanted power to be created, you would phone someone up, they'd move a big lever, mm -hmm. a fireball would happen, electricity would come out the other end of a plant, you're good. Yep. In our new world of renewables, actually the renewable plants are much more volatile um, in that they're p predominantly weather driven. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we have to, we actually don't control them as, as such. Mm -hmm. You know, we, mm -hmm. we let them, we let them run and come in. Yeah, lot. so they go up and down, they, they spike around a lot. So it, predicting what they're going to do accurately is, is really good from, a, from, the, okay. from, the, from the point of view of both cost, but also from the point of view of carbon. Okay, so you've got a lot of processing and you need a big infrastructure to process Absolutely. that and predict. Million dollar question, why choose Oracle? Why mm -hmm. Oracle? Um, so Oracle were the first at the time to come with the latest NVIDIA cards available in, okay, o so in OCI. Fine. Yeah, um, an awesome tech. Um, for those of you in the audience that haven't looked at the, um, the compute that's available there, you know, you're looking at the central core running at about 120 terafive, 25 teraflops, um, 900 gig a second of memory throughput, and it's using about 300 watts at full chat. That's awesome. Yeah, um, we use that extensively for our model training. Which so allows, that's it, so it's, a, yeah. it's the sheer power reliability. I mean, you, know, you guys know a thing or two about reliability. Yeah, and yeah. so, so and we've so got one of these jobs where we are not allowed to fail, we can't fail. Um, we've used Oracle databases for many, many years. We've got a, a very ingrained um, heritage with the databases that we have set up. Um, so it's, to, to me, it's just a natural step, a natural progression that we actually use the, um, the machine learning stuff within the OCI space. Um, and it it's really does work. Okay. Um, Excellent, James. And what next then is closing question? What next with the cloud? Because now you've got that underway, are you using OCI for that? Yeah, so, so what next? I, mean, I, think, I think one touched on just now about the, the elasticity. You know, mm -hmm. I, want, I need to be able to run models really, really wide compute, but for a short period of time, because the older the data is, the less helpful it is to our control center. Okay. So you're forging ahead with that. Yeah. James, thank you very much indeed for joining us this morning. Thank you for the welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Juan. There's been a lot of information, I think, passed across there. That was at least a 4K video stream, if not an 8K video stream, being pumped away. So what do we think are the key takeaways? Certainly, I'll give, kick off with one. We're going to need to develop data-driven apps underneath these data-driven organizations. But it can be simple. It doesn't need to be as complex as it looks in the start. That has to be one takeaway message. Yeah, absolutely. By integrating all the technology, 
into the database, we're going to make that data-driven apps a lot easier. A second big thing we talked about is converged database. It dramatically simplifies development in IT to put all the functions together instead of trying to separate them all and, and synchronize them all. And I think, I'm guessing a lot of people here already realize this, but my goodness, machine learning is enabling a whole new era of IT. And I think it's going to extend beyond the database, and the database, of course, is going to get smarter and smarter as things go forward as well. But I'm quite sure our children are going to look back and wonder about a world where we had to drudgery manage the data ourselves. Of course, machine learning is going to do that. Yes, autonomous database is the future. It's just like self-driving cars are the future of automobiles, autonomous databases are the future of databases. And lastly, we talked about cloud the right way, which is an enterprise mission critical cloud at large scale with true elasticity, with the products that you currently use that's partnered with other clouds to make your life simple. So cloud the right way, that's another big that's takeaway another big takeaway. Ladies and gentlemen, it's now 20 past 12 on the second day of Oracle Open World, and it's time for uh, a break. I want to thank you very much indeed for your attention. Of course, thank you to Juan as well. I hope you've learned something. I sincerely hope that we've provided some signposts to the future for you. Do please enjoy the rest of the sessions today. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Thank you. Thank you.